So are we live? Three, two, one. I think it's good to have pressure on yourself. The worst crime is to get kind of really complacent. Like me, over on first days with Murray. Or Saturdays, or Tuesdays, or whatever the fuck with Murray. Hello everybody, I'm your host, Ian Taylor. Joining me tonight, as always, is my wonderful co-host, musician, artist, filmmaker, uh, pretentious connoisseur, Devin King. And who are yes. these two weirdos with us tonight? Uh, let's start with the weirdo oh. with the orange hat. Uh, who are you? <laughs> hey, what's up? It's Daryl. I'm back. My orange hat is invading once again. Uh, oh, yeah. Local cinematographer, indie filmmaker, um, in general, asshat. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> ready to talk some Edgar Wright tonight. Where the, the fuck are you? Where the fuck you're from? Oh, oh London, Ontario. Uh, oh, you're from Ontario, there, eh? Uh, oh, I heard don't you the, know, uh, bud. Oh, bud, I hear <laughs> oh, the weather is bud. awfully good up there this time of year with all the maple syrup and the polar bears and such. Yes, oh, it's suddenly, suddenly the podcast turned into an episode of Letter Kenny. I swear to God. Uh, <laughs> I the only uh, fucking yeah. yank around here. Uh, hi, how is everyone tonight? How are you, Steve? Yeah. I am it's doing. Because you love yanking your chain, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> hey! Yeah! Hey! Hey. No, I'm I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Who yeah. are you? It's, what do you do? Oh yeah. Uh, well, I'm Stephen Beeson. I mean, do I have to introduce myself? Come on, I've been uh, on the show Stephen, quite a few times. What if so people my... are watching this episode for the first time? What if this is their introduction <laughs> well, I, to Tuesday? I Stays definitely more? apologize. Then uh, no, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Stephen so. Beeson, independent filmmaker here in uh, Arkansas. Uh, I, I am the writer and director of Hopeless Romantic, which is a short film that you may have seen. Uh, we, like, currently, uh, I think we have, like, gosh, uh, like a thousand likes on Facebook, like 5,000 engagements across a bunch of different social media platforms. Reeling in them numbers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, so very exciting stuff. Uh, we, we were actually uh, supposed to be in Austin the end of this month uh, to pick up a finalist award. That didn't quite pan out. Everybody had made other travel plans, but uh, had actually uh, mentioned on my Facebook page the other day that we're I'm uh, hard at work on another short, hopefully something coming soon. And uh, yeah, so exciting stuff all the way around. I'm happy to be here. Are you also oh, yeah, going to be filming you. your short in your neighborhood, or are you filming somewhere else? Uh, that is to be determined. Uh, ah. we, <laughs> it's funny. I had a short that would have uh, put me in your neck of the woods and uh, was going to be set in a snowy location, but uh, it did not turn out to be the uh, the right timing for that one. So uh, we're working on other projects now, and... Uh, who knows? Maybe. Maybe something soon. All, all, all yeah. good things come in time, and we'll be there to help out if you need anything. I if appreciate you that. Uh, typical, you end up moving um, your stuff up here. Tip, typical up American here. to come uh, get the tax breaks in Canada, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so Edgar Wright. What, what's what's first on the uh, Edgar wright -ness -ness? Before we start, Devin, I really hate to do this, but I literally just realized this. The years of oh, the movie nice. are wrong on the thumbnail. I'm so sorry. I just noticed that we're live. Uh -oh. That's really embarrassing. We... I'm so sorry. Oh, no. But that's okay. Uh... We're going to do it live. I'm going to mention in the YouTube video and the but... podcast that, you know, that was just an error on my part. I forced Fuck my it. friend we'll to do it live. Force my friend uh, to rush a thumbnail, and that wasn't cool. So I will take the heat on that one because I also didn't very, until three minutes in. So very we're doing it live. Not cash money of you, Devin. Uh, no, disappointed. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Fuck it. <laughs> Fuck it. Fate sucks. But no, it's all right. <laughs> it happens, and maybe it was bad on purpose. Who knows? You, you don't know. Maybe we're uh, we're in the Jesus. middle of a lightning storm, so my connection might be a bit iffy on my end as it just was oh yeah, yes well uh ian will be sure to fix that in post oh so definitely famous famous I'm last so words on any good film set. at fixing things in oh post. yeah anyways uh hot fuzz is first on our agenda uh 2007 movie wait what am i doing Devin, would you like to introduce yes. hot fuzz 
before you lose connection. I am so glad you asked because I this is the one I've been wanting to talk about. So Hot Fuzz yeah. is the second film of the Cornetto trilogy. We're not talking about Shaun of the Dead tonight, much to many chagrin. A uh, funny story. I remember being back in high school and people were talking about this great little movie called Shaun of the Dead that had just come out and you know, being the snobby teenager that I was, I'm like, yeah, I'm not really into zombie films. It doesn't sound like my kind of thing. But then they were telling me, oh, it's different. It's actually funny. There's lots of cool action sequences. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll get to that. You know, really just kind of shrugged it off. And then out of the blue, or I guess some years later, I come across Hot Fuzz. And I'm like, holy shit, look at this cop movie. Uh, I wonder who the guy behind it uh, this was. And um, little, little, lo and behold, it was uh, Edgar Wright, the same guy that did Shaun of the Dead. And it was because of this movie that I went and gave that movie uh, a second chance and a watch. And, man, it was just a roller coaster of discovery. So this was right around the time I believe Grindhouse was coming out as well. And all these films coming out around this time, 2007, was a hell of a year for cinema. And I think this was just part of the awakening to you know, cinema in my upbringing uh, to, to an extent. Just having movies like this, like Hot Fuzz coming out, Grindhouse – and later on, I discover um, There Will Be Blood and No Country for All Men that also came out that year. So, yeah, 2007 was a hell of a year for films. And Hot Fuzz, I'm just going to say off the bat, is probably still my favorite of the whole Cornetto trilogy. Uh, probably just because it was the first of them that I had come across or that I had watched. Because um, this is a film that really blends genres really well. This is the first quote-unquote genre-blending movie. That I remember seeing where just the switches from like a buddy cop movie to a mystery to a horror film kind of all happen in a sort of organic kind of pacing. I remember just being so blown away by this film when it, when it first came out and when I first saw it. Um, that yeah, it still holds up as one of my personal favorites to, to this day. Nice. Very, nice very man. nice introduction. This was actually my first time watching this. What? Um, I had seen Shaun of the Dead I, some I'm out. time ago. I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm done. Nope. <laughs> I, no, there no, are no, no. true consorts here. Uh, I had <laughs> I had seen uh, Shaun of the Dead some time ago, and uh, yeah, so I finally sat down. You know, I I love Shaun of the Dead. Sat down, watched this. I thought it was great. I mean, uh, no spoilers, but uh, yeah, it definitely holds up. I I love the. Uh, I love the genre blending, as, as Devin was talking about. Really actually surprised uh, how much that I liked it. I, I will say, I think I prefer Shaun of the Dead, in a way. Um, but no, I, but yeah, no, it, it, mostly all good things to say. So I prefer yeah, Shaun of I mean, the Dead. Sorry, go on. Yeah, I love the uh, movie references that were in it. You know, the way, um, the way this film contrasts kind of the cinematic fictional uh, story of being a cop versus actually being a cop though still done in a very cinematic way i thought that was very interesting and it's uh calls your attention to all these kind of movie tropes and how unrealistic they are and i love this uh you know trend that happens throughout the whole film where um you know danny keeps asking uh sergeant angel all these annoying questions about you know is there a spot in a man's head that if you shoot it it'll blow up no. Or have you <laughs> yeah. ever been, have you have you ever uh you know fired your gun while flying through the air? Have you ever fired two guns flying through the air? Just all these you know movie kind of questions. And something that I've heard quite a few police uh, officers I should say <laughs> uh, comment on in this film is that they love how doing how doing the paperwork was showcased in this film because that is just a very real thing that most of policing is. It's not just you know catching people who are. Uh, breaking the law but you also have to document them very thoroughly and that is a very unsung part of the job that's mm -hmm. you know it's just very tedious and annoying but they showcase it in a very kind of fun cinematic way every time he arrests somebody he just clicks two pens and it just has a <laughs> montage sequences of him processing everybody and uh you know just just him being completely prim and proper about the job and it's quite a contrast to his character in Shaun of the dead where he's just kind of this you know underachieving loser and i love this you know, all these different kind of characters that they do throughout the Cornetto trilogy. I mean, we're not talking about all three Cornettos. This is the one of the three. But um, in each one, they try something different with these characters, which I really love. And they play with Simon Page and Nick Frost's uh, dynamic uh, between all three films. Um, 
And fun fact about the Cornetto trilogy, the reason it's called that is because the Cornetto cone does show up at some point in the film. But where Edgar Wright got this idea was um, when he was in college, his, ha- his go-to hangover tier was to eat a Cornetto cone the first thing in the morning. So that's where that came from. So you're well, saying he I- got a brainwave. Yeah, <laughs> I I do wanna I do wanna give other people a chance to talk here, but just real quick, bouncing off of what Devin was saying, you know how they're kind of like yeah, making this love letter to cinema in a way, and they're kind of like addressing these tropes. And there's even multiple moments that are like uh, straight from uh, Point Break. Point Break becomes like a character in itself. Have you ever fired your gun in the air and yelled, oh, no, I never fired my gun in the air and yelled, right, oh. right, right. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, one thing that I was, uh, that I did uh, learn on the uh, director's commentary with uh, Quentin Tarantino and uh, Edgar Wright, they were talking about how that all of the people in the town were these kind of like Easter eggs because they were people from other films who had played bit parts or bad guys or, you know, in the case of uh, uh, Billy Whitelaw, who uh, is the actress that plays Joyce, one of these town residents, she was like Mrs. Baylock in The Omen. And, you know, there was a couple of guys that were like background extras in the town uh, you know, one of them was like from Brannigan and one of them was from like Nightmare on Elm Street 4, you know. And so it was really cool because that was his way of kind of tipping his hat to the audience. Like, yeah, these there's something off here, you know, and if you're if you love cinema, you're going to pick up on that. You're going to pick up on. Oh, wait a minute. This is the guy from. You know? yeah. yeah, so I, I thought that was really fun and just a very kind of like subtle little thing they did, and I, I definitely appreciated that. Well, we need to talk I about th- the cast in general. Like, it's, not like just, meta, yeah. It, yeah. it's like meta-contextual casting, if, mm. if you want to come up with as big a word to describe it as possible. In a way, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but... And, and, and just one more fun fact I'll mention off the bat before we get into it, but this was a fun you know, a uh, bit of the story when they were developing is that uh, Edgar Wright ended up filming this in his hometown, which was uh, something that he didn't think that the townspeople uh, that he grew up with there would be cool with once they uh, read what the script was or what the plot was. But I guess they were all happy uh, to be part of it regardless, um, which is yeah. pretty cool of them considering what the plot is about, which I don't think I've even described what the plot was. Does anyone want, want to take that out? Mm-hmm. Hey, how about uh, how about Daryl? Daryl, you've been kind of—I hey, mean, this was yeah. your idea. What, what would you say this True. movie's about? <laughs> you guys kind of touched on it. It's like the the buddy cop sense of like a, a a very overachieving cop from London gets a promotion of sorts to, but he's kind of like forced out to go to the country because he basically makes everyone else look bad with his um amazing he, arrest he, record. He, he, he's too good at his job that they're like, you're making us look bad. We're gonna send you out to the countryside where nothing happens. Can't have you being the sheriff of London. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he ends up arresting, as they joke, like half the city in his very first night. And um, <laughs> yeah, he's he's all about like what's good and what's right and like the bigger ideals of being a cop, which I think is a, a very big theme in a lot of the 80s movies that you're saying it, it does reference. Um, and kind of in a very Tarantino way, I think Tarantino gets a lot of the credit for being somebody who can homage in films. But like you were saying, like there's a lot from other films in this movie, but it, the way it's woven into the fabric of it, it doesn't feel like, oh, we're doing this to just be a, a cheap homage. It's actually part of the story and the structure. Um, so yeah, it kind of goes through that and it mixes in horror elements as uh, lots of accidents go on throughout the the city. and um, Collisions. Well, yeah, <laughs> collisions. And uh yeah, piece by piece this kind of big web is woven and um yeah, when it gets to the end it's uh maybe not as complex as once assumed. I don't want to spoil the the whole damn thing. Please do. Um but it's amazing. Like I I really love this film. Um kind of like uh Devin was saying, I connected with it first of all of the Cornetto trilogy. Um, we were all like at some fucking pool party at like the end of grade, I don't know, 11 or 12. And they were, you know, putting on a movie in the background and I watched the entire thing. I was so enthralled. Um, like the, it's very influential kind of film for me, like the way he's able to do montages kind of, again, like, like you're saying with the 
the paperwork even like every single travel yeah. montage like things that could usually be pulled and stretched out in normal screenplays are so dense and compact and visually told i think it's kind of worth noting that like i'm yeah yeah there's a different cinematographer on every film we're going to talk about tonight and hmm. like in general most edgar wright films if you told me one person had shot them all wes anderson style i'd believe you but it's that like he storyboards it so thoroughly he has such a grasp of like the language that is visual cinema and i think a lot of directors nowadays maybe are too um like theatrical like word based like maybe they just want images like i feel like edgar wright can mare both in ways that like are, it's so rare nowadays and uh yeah again like you said part of the reason i suggested this whole episode is because i think he's like a serious cut above most filmmakers um i you know it's like he took a four-hour screenplay and condensed it so tightly to fit into like what is it two hours and one minute or something yeah Top just it's like hours. almost two hours exactly but... yeah and, and it's so like even with the you know i won't spoil but like there's kind of a false ending and like uh, it kind of has a little bit of the lord of the rings like oh, there's, like <laughs> four know, endings yeah. happening but i think most are earned and they're all so quick like here's the thing if we spent five minutes at that gravestone and there was this big speech then it would feel a bit cheap but no he reveals it right away he tells you like he he makes you hold your breath but not for too long it's it's like he knows mm. the right amount and um yeah i think you know as he progressed throughout his career he just got better and better um i i i honestly uh i love this film a lot but that's mostly my spiel for for this <laughs> well and it's, I, it's interesting you were you were talking about like uh you know tarantino getting credit for for homages and i thought it was interesting because on the director's commentary they talked about um that <laughs> tarantino actually invited edgar wright to his house and like private theater and they would watch um all all kinds of these like old cop movies because at first tarantino was like ah, i don't know what are what are you doing and he's like no it's gonna be a cop movie and he's like oh my god you've got to see this <laughs> and so they had like a private screening of uh live like a cop die like a man you know and a bunch of these like uh, you know a bunch really of these old school cops. 80s cop movies and they were even talking about some of the like canon films on the on the director's commentary where like you know it's chuck norris versus essentially michael myers in this movie called hero in the terror which is this <laughs> terrible movie but it was so fascinating that they were kind of like blending those genres um and, and that that was something that edgar wright was pulling from specifically because he was you know i mean there is kind of this almost like giallo horror element to this it's very action comedy it's very fast paced mm -hmm. and yet it's able to uh marry all of those things together and and it be cohesive and you know the thing is i mean this is just right at two hours but i never felt the runtime it's no. so frenetic it's so fast paced um yeah this is yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I I think it's briskly paced. It's very fun. Every time I put this on, it's just always a good time. It has such great rewatch value. And I can't believe yeah. I, forgot, I forgot to mention this earlier, but talking about, you know, Grindhouse, I believe Edgar Wright actually directed one of the fake movie trailers for, you know, that Grindhouse screening. I think yep. it was Don't. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. So so it makes sense. And I love that those two, uh, you know, just hang out. And I think they make each other's films better in a sense just by being friends. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I wish I could say the same for Eli Roth. <laughs> oh. Hey, got hey, him. Hey, hey, Eli alone, okay? Come on. All right, let's change I know, the that, 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 that was that was a cheap stab. Yep. I agree. I, I, I actually, yeah, I, guys, you know. Come on, let's I not like shit on Eli, Eli Roth. Roth. Let's talk about a good <laughs> filmmaker. Uh, oh. it's so, oh, Hot Fuzz. I, I like him. I think I'm, anyway, with, we'll save that for later. I'm with you, Stephen, um, where this is not as good as Shaun of the Dead, but it's so marginal. Like, I... This is such a yeah, fantastic no, it, movie, it's, and yeah. it's so quotable. Like, I quote this movie, like, 24-7 just with my friends and shit. Like, the whole bar scene alone is just, like, great quote after great quote after great quote. Like, uh, you, when's your birthday? 22nd of February? What year? Every year. Every Get year. out. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, you, when's your birthday? It's like, October 12, 1964? Sorry, 47. Uh-huh. Out. 
you there. Oh, out. <laughs> like, it's just, it's so quick. The actors do such a great job of telling the jokes, but it never lingers on anything too long. There's never a moment where it's, like, jerking off how great its humor is. It's all just so fast and well, so and quotable. That's the thing. And I feel like it's... that's what makes the rewatch value so great, is you pick up on jokes and gags you never would have even noticed. Oh, yeah, the well, first one I picked up this time was that when um it's the fair, the first time you see, like, the girl who always tells the dirty jokes, she has one guy on either side of her yes. and standing <laughs> above a pig roast. Also, the, the and talking And I was like, statue. are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me, Edgar Wright? <laughs> also, so <laughs> many great running gags and buildups like the the talking statue like there's so many great gigs with him like he just shows oh, up <laughs> he gets killed by the end he shows up at the graveyard and it's oh, so statue. great I love yeah that guy. And oh. he's still doing the statue bit yeah he's it. still doing the statue bit even though he got murdered and there's oh. so much great like buildup like Edgar Wright something that's common throughout all of these films he loves his like buildups and payoffs like he'll set up a line of dialogue and use it later like he'll be you know, like, Nick Frost will shoot the doctor by accident, it'll be like, it's a doctor, he'll deal with it, and then Danny oh, will yeah. do it again, but this time, they want it to happen, it's like, you're a doctor, deal with it, yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> I, I love how they repeat lines through this, or, yeah. you know, like, like uh, Chris Angel will say something, why did I just call him Chris Angel? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nicholas Angel, yeah. Nicholas Angel. Yeah, so, 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 so like, Nick Angel sure will, will, well, Angle, yes. Um, he, 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 he'll say he'll, he'll say something like he corrects Danny on we call them collisions now, not accidents. And then you know Danny at his next opportunity will say that same thing as if he knows it. But he, it just shows that he is learning. Like he's a bit of a doofus, but he is willing to learn, and that's what makes him likable in this. That he well, you know, be, and be, yeah. be, he's, he he shows an effort that he wants to be a better cop, and he is inspired by him. And that's and that's very endearing, and that's what that's I appreciate. That's the turnaround at the end, right? And and and, and yeah, yeah no, uh, he did from his dad. So and uh, he helps put his foot down with uh, talking with the Andes, who are refusing to, you know, <laughs> look into this case any further just because they, you know, they, they they don't think much of it. And then he slams his uh, fist down and says, "Well, we just sat through three hours of so-called acting last night, and the kiss was most was the most convincing part in it." And they're like, is, "Hold you know, on, sit down." Wait, which, which, which is verbatim what uh, you know Angel told him the night before. Um, and sometimes it's like uh, it's not even like exactly the line coming back. One I like early on is, um, "Oh, you want to feel like a big man in a small town? Run up to the model village." And then oh, yeah. you find then that's like a you know a nice little foreshadowing for the ending. Like almost oh, every yeah, line man. in the script like is building towards something. Like you, it's a set. There's, there's this is a perfect example of a film that does set up and payoff so well well unlike the first suicide squad which completely fails at doing any of that <laughs> yeah. well here's no, the, it's, no the first a, 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 yeah a, a, every line foreshadows something and connects to something and i love that so so what are we some kind of hot fuzz, fuzz? Hey. <laughs> hey. Uh, <laughs> and it's you mentioned before like the filmmaking is great the editing is like the best part of this movie like there's so many clever scene oh, transitions yeah. and so much of the humor banks not only on the quotes but also just the editing like stuff you wouldn't even notice like when nicholas angel is in his office and they're trying to convince him to go into the country and it just hurt cuts to their fake stupid smiles <laughs> like that that joke would not be that moment wouldn't be anywhere near as funny if it wasn't for that hard cut like you don't even think about it but the editing is doing a lot of the work for the comedy which is basically the other way around of a lot of comedies around that time where it essentially just relied on dialogue and that's it but this was such relied a on dialogue or air. improv where edgar really uses the you know the cinematic language to also tell like visual gags and well and here's the yeah, here's yeah. the thing that i wanted to kind of jump in here and say like for something to move that quickly and that frenetic of a pace like I don't feel like it doesn't feel uh, exhausting. No, it doesn't feel exhausting, and like nothing went over my head. You know what I mean? Like there may yeah. be a couple of things that I missed that would pay off on a rewatch, but I never felt lost. Like I knew what was happening, and it's so it would be so easy to do something like this and for it to keep that like breakneck pace. Uh, breakneck pace and and you'd be like ah oh, what just happened you know but yeah. i never felt yeah. that it works so well it, it, yeah. there, there there's such a clarity to 
what he's telling you and the joke that it, it just very clearly registers. And it's so rewarding as a viewer that you can watch the film and everything makes sense to you on the first watch, but then there, there are still some things that might come up at you later. And it's just so rewarding on rewatches to pick up on maybe small things you notice, but you also, no, no, yeah, like you're saying, nothing feels like it goes over your head. Like everything just very clearly. No, I was, I was never confused. And I mean, I, I kind of almost, uh, you know, Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman is another kind of like British uh, crime movie. Well, and it's definitely doing a different thing, but I, I, I kind there were a couple of moments that I was like, Oh, what, what just happened? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was so lost that. watching that movie and I was like half asleep too, where, you know, yeah. I, could, I could watch this half asleep and it'll grab your attention. It'll snap you out of it because it's so engaging. Well, and... but it's so easy to follow and it's going at almost an easy, uh, even faster pace. And I think that is something commendable as well for just not just communicating something like that, but for it to translate so well. And part of that mm -hmm. is due to the cast. Like, they're able to convey so much by, like, saying so... Like, yeah, sure, they get a lot of snappy dialogue, but they're also, like, very expressive, and there's some genuinely great, like, serious moments when, like, Nick Frost is talking to Simon Pegg about, like, why he wanted to be a police officer. It's, like, because Dad does it. Like, that's not only... That's not just a funny scene. That's like a genuinely sweet, heartfelt moment with like a lot of hurt behind it. Even though it doesn't last very long, it, it lasts long enough to kind of keep you engaged. And the whole cast, like not even just those two, but there's so many serious actors in this movie. Dude, and Bill Nye so is in there yeah. for like a minute. And, and he's hilarious. Killing it. And yeah, like, uh, Timothy yeah. Dalton is not so perfectly cast as like the douchebag <laughs> grocery store owner. <laughs> Oh, Man, and he's so funny. So great. Oh my it perfectly. He's, he steals every scene that he's in. I love the first <laughs> line, and he says, "I'm a slasher, and I must be stopped." Stop. Yeah. Slasher of prices. Yeah, he's <laughs> right. literally. Like... I, I, I own I own the local supermarché. You should visit me. My my discounts are chiller. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, or yeah. criminal. I, I'm misquoting it, but it's so no, so yeah, charismatic. But... Just the way he introduced himself into the movie. Literally, well, and that was that was something that Edgar Wright was kind of bringing up on the uh, director's commentary. Is like he had watched uh, Enemy of the State with uh, <laughs> Will Smith. That was like a Tony Scott film, and he was talking about there were so many moments that there was like somebody that would show up in the background, and he'd be like, "Wait a minute, that, I know that guy," but he was never like he never got uh, enough screen time, and he was like it seemed like a Hollywood thing um, like to put somebody big name that would like, you just recognize in the background. And this was something that he actively sort of wanted to avoid is like, I want to put these character actors and these people in this film, but I want to have each of them get their own moment to shine. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. And that applies and to like, all, yeah, that applies to all the bit actors too. Like even, like the groceries, like the girl that manages like the <laughs> the speaker at the grocery store. Can I get Mr. Skinner to the front office? Mr. Mr. Skinner. Skinner. Like she's a perfect, that kind of character. She has so much personality, even though she barely shows up in the movie. Like even it does kind of remind me of Wes Anderson in that sense, where there's so mm -hmm. many side characters, but they have so much personality and quirks to them. I they was just thinking kind of stick more... I was thinking more Robert Altman, oh, but that's yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of get you know, what you're saying too. Yeah, no, right? like, every character has such a memorable presence, no matter how minor they are. Like I love the the hooded kids who uh, yes. end up uh, helping out in the end. With <laughs> and again, it's like they're they're characters that you see sideline, but they have a purpose there later on, where you know they uh, he makes them raid the uh, uh, you know. The, the corner store and then you <laughs> cover all the cameras with spray paint before the shootout happens. And then the fucking swan comes back. And like, the you know, swan like, burns in the middle of the fucking movie, <laughs> like fun stuff is important. Like, yeah, I, know. This, I love it. Oh, yeah. So a good. Every incidental throwaway gag ends up serving a purpose later, and that is such great Attention screenwriting and filmmaking. Yeah. Great, yeah. And this was something that I know Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg had worked like absolutely tenaciously on like they had a whole uh, whiteboard and flip paper like you'd see in preschool and they would map out every single character in this town and give them some setup some you know little 
memorable joke and then some payoff. Like they really outlined every character in this movie to make sure that they all serve some purpose later on. And yeah, and it, it definitely shows too. I mean, it mm-hmm. you, you can feel that just by watching it. Like not even knowing that story, you can look at this and be like, yeah, this was made by somebody who was not fucking around. They knew what they wanted to make and they brought it to screen. And I think that is beautiful in and of itself. P- putting this much work into an action comedy of all things too. Yeah, I know. no, a hundred percent. Yeah. It shows just how much potential there is in any of these kind of like, you know, silly kind of story ideas. You can do so much with it. And when you have the right people behind it that put this much passion, you can take a stupid idea or a very simple idea and you can get so much out of it if you put this kind of work and effort behind it. For sure, like, yeah. It's funny that you guys keep leaning into like action and comedy as the main ones because on this rewatch, I found, especially because Last Night in Soho has come out, I, I found it to almost fit like more of a horror structure. Like you have a character who's taken out of like their normal sea and they get somewhat uh, like relaxed and we get to meet a cra- cast and crew of characters and slowly some of them start to die off in very violent, very bloody ways. And yeah. it's yeah. building up to like a mystery a in the background. Movie. Like yeah. I feel like nine times out of 10, if you marketed this film as a horror movie or a horror comedy, whatever, like you could have got away with that. But like, I, I like, that it does lean more into the the buddy cop sense to even that out a bit but like you're saying it's it's mixing so much in the pot that it like describing this sounds like it almost should work yeah like it, yeah no like and, well, and that's that's what i think is that the horror elements work just as much as the comedy elements and just as much like there's as much work put into any one of them that they like i like i said this was the film that first presented like a genre blend that works so well and makes sense and like i haven't seen a film prior to this when I first saw it that blended genres like this. Like, I can't believe this is pulling off being an action cop movie and also a horror mystery uh, with just as much, you know, creativity and passion behind it. Well, and I'm glad, I, I'm glad Daryl brought the horror elements up because I loved those moments. I thought those were great. And, you know, that was something that Edgar Wright talked about on the director's comedy uh, commentary too, was like, yeah, for a while there, there was this like whole genre of like the cop who has to stop the serial killer. And, you know, obviously the Wicker Man, where it's like he goes to, uh, uh, you know, some strange village and it's all kind of in there. And uh, one movie in particular that's from that same genre of like horror cop. And I'm, I'm going to take just a minute as like an aside, but. Uh, there was a movie in like 1983, I think. It was a part of Canon, if you guys are familiar with that. <laughs> and oh, yeah. it, was, it was called 10 to Midnight. And the essential premise was it's a cop uh, played by Charles Bronson, who's still kind of like uh, riding high off like Death Wish, you know. And, and he's the police detective and he has to stop this serial killer who is murdering these women but the entire like hook of the movie is that he murders these women naked. Now, I, I want to stress here, I'm not just saying that he murders naked women. I mean, he strips down <laughs> completely to murder people. And it's as goofy and bizarre as you can possibly imagine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th- that's like, you've got elements of that level of like cheese and insanity. And then you've got stuff like point break, which is probably a better kind of like more widely regarded film. And you've got elements of like the wicker man. And yeah, I mean, going off what Daryl said, it's like marrying all this stuff together in a pot, you know, blending it all together. It shouldn't work. (laughs) Like, but it, it, it does. And I, I mean, yeah, that's man. I, I, I think we could go on about this film all day. Like there's so much good uh, to talk about. I, I will say like, if I had to nitpick, there, there's two things that I kind of want to bring up. Do it. So, Do it. okay. So I really hate CGI blood. I know I hate to be that guy. There's a couple of moments that I could tell they weren't using practical, and that kind of 
that knocked it down. I, I, yeah. I will say, on rewatching this, I did notice the CGI blood a lot more. I mean, I knew it was CGI, probably, watching this on my DVD when it first came out. But uh, this time I had a nice Blu-ray of it, watching it on a full 4K screen. Um, and yeah, I could, I could definitely pick out the CGI blood a lot more on the rewatch, which yeah, only uh, detracts from it slightly for me. I, I can get why Pratchley they did that, they did it that way, but he starts to just notice the look of like a blood splurt asset once you l look at CGI. Well, long and I enough. don't, I don't <laughs> remember CGI blood in Shaun of the Dead. I think that was mostly practical, so that kind of. Or maybe they just implemented that <laughs> sneaker in Shaun of the Dead. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't that know. Being that, said, that was the only thing that like not counter it argument. Down. That pyramid yeah. head kill was a great practical effect. I can't remember oh if they used CGI god. blood for that, but I love oh the god, effect of did, the pyramid yeah. head. That's still, no, the, the, I remember <laughs> that being so shocking to me when it first happened, and it still has an impact, like, all these years later. But yeah, that was that, still a yeah. really good... That's still a great yeah, that, 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 that was the moment where I'm like, holy fuck, I wasn't expecting this movie to go this way. Yeah, uh, that goes full shot to death at that point. Just incredibly it does, so good. brutal. Yeah. But if we're go back to nitpicks, I love... Almost everything about this movie, I don't agree that it's smoothly, so smoothly paced. It does kind of drag towards the end for me. I think it's just like 15, 20 minutes too long, in my opinion. Like, I feel like the third act, it's great and has plenty of moments. The swan death is chef's kiss. And uh, when the kids sneak into the Friday store, she's like, oh no, the, the kids! And like, that's it <laughs> for her character. That was hilarious, but... I feel like it was kind of repetitive. It's like, okay, I get it. He's arresting the whole village. It's the explosive payoff. But I feel like I, it could have been wrapped up a bit sooner. I feel like it could have... There, you didn't I, need to I show knew. every vill member of the village. I, it always... I, it well, happens no, I, every I, time... I, I, I'm just going to cut you off there. Just yeah. I, I, I know how that can feel. Like, it kind of drags a little bit. But I don't know. honestly, showing that he actually never really killed anybody in that entire, like, deadly shootout... I mean, he shootout, killed that's... some of those people. I'm sorry. <laughs> he killed some of those Oh, no, but, like, it, it's, it still shows, like, the whole <laughs> processing element up. Like, there's still sure. counterbalancing the, you know, the, the cinematic portrayal of police officer... Uh, movies and then the reality of it to an extent. I mean, it's still within the cinema context, but I, I like that they showed that everybody, you know, got their comeuppance but weren't actually killed for the most part. Uh, I'm for... actually, I, I kind of lean towards agreeing with Ian for once. I, I thought, wow. <gasps> well, okay, no, no, hear me out. I, I kind of thought that the whole like uh, uh, Lord of the Rings thing where they have like a couple of different endings and like yeah. it took me a minute to register that they were doing the the gag with you know the building explodes and <laughs> and then like oh he's not really dead and I was like ah it's kind of funny but I, I, I kind of wish that it had it, maybe it, cut that a little and bit also I feel it like in the third cool. act like uh, there's parts of it where it's like it, is this intentionally like a parody of shitty crime tropes like the scene where they're like in the bar like ducking from cover and shooting but they're always like out of sync like they happen to come out just when the other person goes for cover it's like okay that was clearly meant to be a parody but there's yeah. also parts where he's like fighting the trolley boy and it's like this shitty shaky cam fight where he throws him around a lot i'm like was that a parody of shitty shaky cam fights in cop movies or is it just kind of bad i don't know I think it's a parody. I think it's all very done inten intentionally. I yeah. don't know if I'd go that yeah. far for stuff like that, but I'm a little confused up. But it's such a nitpick because it, it's the only part of the movie because the rest of the film goes by so well smoothly, but the last 20 minutes or so, I'm like, eh, it could have wrapped up at this point. But that's it, though. That's like my one stain against the film. Yeah, I think that was that was my main issue is just a little bit of pacing and uh, the CGI blood, which I'm kind of snobby about. I will admit, but uh, <laughs> can should we should we go to to final rating? Yeah, I think so. I think are. I think it's I think I could sing praises about this movie all day. I'll just wrap sure. up my thoughts saying, you know, it's it's one of the most rewatchable fun movies that I have that. I could watch with the rest of the family, and they're not going to complain about, which is awesome. There's very yeah, for movies, sure. Yeah, you know, there's very few movies that everybody agrees on and is okay with watching. Even the horror elements, you know, I know I have, you know, people in my family that aren't huge on them, but you know, they they, they can look over, they can look past it to all the fun elements of the film. 
which I think is great. Um, for me, this is like a 9.6. This is as close to a perfect Ooh, move as Edgar Wright has made, in my opinion. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I think it's good. I, I don't necessarily think it's, uh, it's that level. Um, that would be more what I would give to Shaun of the Dead, honestly. Fair enough. Uh, and again, I think with, we're all going to be splitting hairs. No, no, that's yeah. For these because so, they're, so they're, they're all they're all solid. Like on average, for me, the Cornetto trilogy is like an eight average. Yeah, no, and, and so for this one, I'm going to be like right at an eight, but not quite. I, I'm going to give this a, a solid seven point five. I, I think it's good. I think it's great. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did have a few problems with it, not enough to detract overall. Um, but yeah, I had a good time with it. That was way too low. I'm hurt. No, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Daryl? I'll tell you what. For, uh, you, for you, I'll bump it to an eight. Okay? Yeah. There we go. That's what we need. At the very least, it's an eight. Peer pressure. <laughs> okay. to it. Peer pressure. Um, I am actually like a, this is like a nine, five. I kind of echo what Devin wow. said, but I, I leave a bit of space. Okay. And also like, I, I do have a bit of counter argument real quick to what you guys are saying. I think the end of the movie is built mainly for like a one time, like, sorry, a first time watch scenario because like everything is Chekhov's gun. So I get what you're saying where it kind of does feel like it drags, but it, that's because at that point it's breaking conventional pacing that it's adhered to the entire time. Cause it has left that guy up in the, in the office and never addressed him. And like an eagle eyed viewer would be like, well, where the fuck is that guy? He watches like, you know what I mean? Like he would have held down the fort and the bomb is like a big part of the middle bit of the movie. Like it's one of the funnier yeah. scenes with the whole, like, rah, 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 rah. he said, rah, rah, rah. you know, blah, blah. I, I, you know, the whole bit. <laughs> But uh, like I think it builds up to those two Chekhov's guns needing to go off, which you can't just end a movie in the debris. So to me, it does justify the steps it takes at the end, which leaves it at the nine point five for me. But I, I leave a bit okay. of grace because nice. there's mm -hmm. there's a better movie. But and, I, and and I yeah. I think it holds up to scrutiny on several several rewatches. And and again, That's I'm a little right, biased, yeah. but. You know, just watching this movie again, it's just as fun as it was the first time, even if there's things I can nitpick. So that's why it climbed up the ladder for me. Nice. Very, very nice. I, I would that. just slightly lower than you two. I'm giving this one a 9 out of 10. Uh, really? I am the odd man Excellent. It is an excellent you, movie. Dude. It's ah. one of the most quotable movies I've seen. The editing is great. There's a high attention to detail and the storytelling and the filmmaking behind it. Uh, Shaun the Dead is like a nine and a half. Shaun the Dead and Scott Pilgrim are like top tier actor right for me personally, but I, yeah, Hot Fuzz is still an excellent, solid second place in the Cornetto trilogy. Uh, all right, uh, uh, top three can rank the Cornetto trilogy. Go. Uh, Steven hasn't seen The World's End, but I want to hear Daryl right. and Devin rate the Cornetto well, trilogy. Go. World's End is an eight five, um, and Shaun of the Dead is a nine. Nice. So I think it's it, it yeah. kind of steadily steps up in that. For regard. me, I would give uh, Hot Fuzz like an 8, and I would give Shaun of the Dead like a 9.5. Uh, I need to see World's End now. Yes, you do. So. I'm, I, I'm the opposite with Steven. I slightly prefer Hot Fuzz over Shaun of the Dead. But again, these are all excellent films. Like Again, on average, all three of them are like solid 8s, but I just give the ever so slight edge to Hot Fuzz and World's End. I would uh, I find myself rewatching that a little more than Shaun of the Dead. Nice. But again, any of these movies are a good time. I know. Uh, uh, I give Hot Shaun of the Dead nine and a half, Hot Fuzz a nine, World's End also nine, but it's closer to an eight point five than nine point five. Whereas Hot Fuzz is definitely closer to a nine point five for me. Yeah. And uh, Tad's kicking around. I don't know if you. Oh, wanna... Tad! Sorry, Tad. I forgot you were around. Uh, why don't you come on board? Uh, tell people who you are and what you think of. Fuzz hot. If he wants. If, if he no, wants. I, yeah, yeah. I it's your choice. He, I see him typing. No, that's all right. I'm just listening. Well, thank you cool. for listening, Tad. You're the best. All right, now it's He's time like for some bottoms. Podcast. <laughs> Bill bottoms. <laughs> Bottoms. Oh, buddy, it's baby driver time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh boy. Okay. Well. Um. Okay. So, I'll give this a quicker intro because I feel like there's 
tons of shit to talk about with this one and maybe some more varying opinions but <laughs> baby driver um you that was a wrong date was it 2017 yes Is that 2017 the date oh man okay so by and large like this movie like took me from the very first time i saw it in cinema i had to go see it twice with my girlfriend once with my parents at the drive-in and once with my bandmates because i just had to keep going back to the theater to see it uh let me also acknowledge right at the top this all was before any allegations had come out for any of the lead actors in this movie. Uh, i know I we will get there and i'm just gonna address it right now <laughs> skip over that i was that's where my obsession was born and uh so as i mentioned big fan of the cornetto trilogy uh, I was like, oh, cool. This looks like something new and something different. And uh, there's a lot of buildup. It was a script that he had been working on for a long time. And I I think it absolutely delivers. It's, you know, your typical driver type movie centered around this this guy who, you know, he's a, he's a devil behind the wheel. And uh, he's just, you know, he's got tetanus in his ears from a, an accident that he had when he was a kid and uh always is listening to music because of that we get just a bouncing soundtrack throughout the movie and it's almost like a borderline musical in the way that the music interacts with the visuals um but it centers around him doing multiple heists for uh you know as we said kevin spacey's in this movie and he's kind of the head of this little um ring of a uh, bank robbery kind of deals and uh there's a eclectic cast of great actors and uh yeah honestly like, i just want to hear what everyone has to think about it because i could i could just gush about this for an hour myself uh, so. <laughs> so i remember when this well first of all i just want to point out i got the dates completely wrong i don't know why i thought that baby driver came out in 2014 in soho in 2018 uh i guess it's just been a long pandemic That's uh, right. so we'll have <laughs> yeah. to, we'll have to yeah. correct that afterwards people who uh people in the chat will in the comments will probably be correcting that but i'm just gonna call myself out for that mistake this is what happens when you make a banner last minute um but no um i remember when this first came out and there was a bit of that hum and haw and apprehension like oh edgar wright's making another movie awesome oh it doesn't have simon Pegg or nick frost in it mm. don't know how that's gonna work because those two yeah, had right. <laughs> an on-screen chemistry and the and it was like the collaboration of edgar wright nick frost and simon Pegg together made for such a magical moment in these in those three movies so how can he follow that up with anything different? And for the most part, I thought he did really well with it. I remember being really hyped for this in the cinema, really enjoying it. It didn't have some of the same kind of chemistry or comedic moments that the Cornetto trilogy had. But for the most part, I thought it was a pretty solid film. Um, I don't find myself going back to this one as often as the Cornetto trilogy. Just because of, you know, Snick Frost and Simon Page's on-screen chemistry just makes for it. But it still, I think, has a fair bit of rewatch of value. It is... Um, you know, it's a very cinematic kind of uh, film. It's not very realistic. I know um, Stephen posted a video from Larry Lawton talking about, you know, the bank heist scene from the very opening shot and how unrealistic it is in some uh, elements. Like the fact that these guys are walking in just wearing trench coats, wearing, uh, you know, bandanas on their faces with bags. I mean, no one's going to spot that. And the fact that he's like listening to music the whole time. And, you know, you can nitpick those things for days, but I don't think that's what the point of this film was. It was meant no. to be kind of an homage to, you know, movies like The Driver and uh, other uh, films. And actually, I think Edgar Wright attempted something like this with the music video of his earlier on. I forget what the band was, but it was something about synchronizing music with, uh, you know, these actions as they were going on. And that was kind of the whole uh, point of doing this film was to create like the synchronicity between the music and the action on screen and with him having this uh hearing you know disability with the tinnitus ringing and how all of his actions are kind of dictated by the music he's listening to i thought was a really interesting you know element to show cinematically and i thought they did an excellent job with the choreography and the stunts uh in this film and i remember reading uh and reading into this when it came out but one detail i thought was really fascinating and unique for this film is they actually had an editor on set uh, during these car sequences, sequence, like sequencing these takes in real time to make sure that it would line up with the music that they were going to use, so that when you know the camera passed by the pillar chasing the car uh, in the parking garage, that the pillar would uh, wipe across screen on beat and things like that. And just that is really an unheard of setup to have your editor on set as you're filming just kind of roughing the sequences together as you're filming it to make sure that 
everything works out time-wise. So I do think the film deserves credit at least for that um, and the technical elements. But I do think the film mostly pays off. It's not my favorite Edgar Wright film. I do, it's not. I don't hold it quite as high regard with uh, the Cornetto trilogy or Scott Pilgrim. But I still think it's a fun movie. Yeah, I mean, uh, all right. Let me let me talk about the things I like <laughs> about this film. Uh, right. So this is <laughs> this is definitely inspired by uh, Walter Hill's The Driver, uh, which is a movie that I definitely think we should talk about uh, at some point. Um, especially now that we've done Drive and Baby Driver, which are both <laughs> very indebted to uh, Walter Hill's The Driver. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Walter Hill's The Driver is actually, you know, it, it, uh, Ryan O'Neill, uh, Isabella Ajani, and I mean, Bruce Dern. It's an absolutely classic Wait, film. Wait, Ajani? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 and in fact, I mean, you can feel the influence of the driver in this specifically because uh, Walter Hill himself makes a cameo uh, in the courtroom scene. There's also uh, the the inmate number on uh, on Baby Driver's uh, jail kind of you know uniform or whatever uh, that is corresponding to the release date of the driver so it's like it ends in 78 and so on and so forth um and so i love those like technical touches i think that the gimmick of you know synchronizing the music to these certain scenes i mean it almost has this like uh, a music video kind of like aesthetic and i i 100 oh, and 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 yeah, this no, was no, what no. edgar was uh and, and this is exactly what edgar started this Whole idea with you actually see a clip of the music video where he first attempted this idea that he made years ago on tv for a second well, so this was yeah. something he was trying to build to to make for quite a while and I, um, I, you like the sequences of him running to go get coffee and lyrics for the song are written on like on posts and on the, on the side of the wall and on the ground um so yeah you know, this is very much the gimmick of this film and whether or no. not you know the gimmick was used in a in a way that you thought was uh, engaging or purposeful or whatnot, I still think no. it's fun. No, no, it is fun. But here's kind of my core problem with the film is like I feel like the the scenes that utilize that gimmick and that are you know like all of the car chase and the you know the sequences where they're driving or they're you know whatever like I feel like those are incredible. But the rest of the film is not as incredible. It's kind of, it's kind of average in a way, and I really hate to say that. Um, I think, I think there are definitely good performances in this. Um, I think, uh, gosh, um, John Hamm is incredible. Uh, oh, he's I great. Thought, no, I thought he was fantastic. I thought Isa Gonzalez was great. Um, Ansel Elgort, I mean, he's okay. I, I, I think you I have the same really... problem with Ansel Elgort that you have with Timothy Chalamet. No, no, it's not even that. I mean, well, Timothy Chalamet hasn't been accused of you know, the things that Ansel I, has. I was going to say, but, unfortunately, he's great in this movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's that's kind of it. I mean, he's okay. He's serviceable. I don't think he's like, he's not kind of wowing me. Uh, but but he doesn't like his character almost feels like the least interesting character and i feel like you know it yes it's doing the same thing as hot fuzz where it's like it's blending all these genres together there's like elements of uh, uh, of true romance and badlands and you know the driver and then you've got this kind of like odd kind of like quirky offbeat musical thing going on and i don't know i don't think that it works quite as well as some of edgar wright's other films unfortunately um i actually think i actually think jamie fox is kind of bad in this i don't what? think kevin spacey is that great oh either. i disagree I, uh, I i i, I mean, hate what even, kevin spacey even, did but I've, no, I'm not great. even saying I'm not even saying that because of the allegations that have come forward against them. I mean, you know, taking that aside, I just feel like Kevin Spacey, like, I mean, I've I've seen him do this kind of part better. 
You know what I mean? Like, okay, but you can't, better, but still you can't good. necessarily like judge. Okay, so the thing with this film is, Tad had a really good point on the rewatch when he was watching it with me. That is uh, specifically to El Gore, but it applies to Spacey too. Is that like as actors, this movie exposes how one note they can be, but akin to say a Jack Black in a School of Rock, there is certain roles where casting does the heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Ansel Elgort is perfect for this role because of the quiet nature, because he has to do it all through these like half hidden stairs where he has to be like hiding his true feelings because he's too afraid to let anyone get too close. And sure, yeah, it might be some typical stuff, but as for Spacey too, like you said, he's done it better in some other stuff before, but for what that specific character needed and how he needed to ride this line I mean, I will... untrustworthy and yeah. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, mean, I, I, I think of... most of their strengths, even if you find that their acting ability is limited, I do think that the screenplay does work to their strengths. So I think yeah. the casting for this type of movie works well. Well, I mean, I, I'll agree with that. And that's something, you know, that you notice with uh, Keanu Reeves or you notice with like a, a, a Gal Gadot or a Nicolas Cage. It's like they're always... It's like they may have a limited range, but they're really good in that range, you know? Ah. <laughs> like, oh, it, it's yeah. like comparing Keanu <laughs> Reeves in The Matrix versus Knock Knock. Oh, or well, he's or, just or, as bad or, 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 um, or, or The Lake I mean, House. Honestly, I think it's, uh, I think it's so bad. It's, I, I don't even know that it's so bad it's good. I had fun with it. Oh, I have fun um, with it too, but it is. Awful. Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Anyways. Uh, I was having fun at it. So, yeah. Steven. Yeah, Ian. There was once upon a time where I would have agreed 100% with what you were saying about Baby Driver. I had those exact same feelings the first time I watched it in theaters. It just, I don't know, it didn't really leave me feeling much. However, for whatever reason, on a second watch, I the film just got so much better. Like, I don't know what, the yes, parts were still stupid. I still don't buy the romance. I still don't buy the sacrifice scene at the end, even though... Mm-hmm. The, Allocations aside, writing wise, that sci fi scene was so stupid and it didn't make sense for his character's motivations. However, what? What do you I, no, 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 I don't want to talk get, about that. We'll get, back to, about? we'll get back to that. I'm going to put a pin on that. I think this is a film that uses its genre trappings to hide the fact that it's actually got a pretty potent message about like confronting your actions and learning to deal with the consequences of your actions instead of trying to hide away from them. And I think huh. the movie I handles that message. That. Hey! <laughs> hey! And then so, hey! <laughs> yeah, I wonder what that's for. Maybe I could write new little something there. But I actually think the film does a really good job with that message. And I like how the first half is more goofy and entertaining, but the second half is more serious as, like, shit hits the fan. Like, yeah. it's not a particularly unique take on that genre trope, but it works really well for this kind I, of story. I think it's well done. It's very uh, well and, done and, in and, that and, sense. And it knows what genre niche it's fulfilling, mm-hmm. and it accelerates yeah. in within that limited kind of yeah. scope. So, exactly. You know, I, it's I, very simple. I mean, that's that's honestly one very of the problems I, I have with it, though. It's like, it's technically, it's okay, I mean, but I don't think it adds much. No, the I, I think Ted is but he, you yeah, didn't the think they, the, did it. Yeah, you didn't but, think the ending added much to the conversation because that was a very unique I mean, take on it, this kind of story for me. Because most I mean, stories would be like, oh, I'm just going to run off with my lover at the yeah. end. Or, oh, we're just, you know, they're going to brush it off like nothing's the matter. Or there's going to be some bullshit, do a sex machina, fatal attraction style where I'll get out of trouble in the end. No, 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 he, he accepts his consequences. He faces them. He takes 25 years of potential jail time for the people he loves. And that's that's something I haven't really seen this kind of story before. And that was incredibly Yeah, but well I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about the last five minutes. But it's you know something. I mean? That's I mean, something. Yeah, that's more than minutes. arguably the next film we're talking about, if I'm being honest. But Yeah, totally. Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like... Yeah, I, I just like I feel like technically this is a, a, a marvel. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's very well made. I think from the cinematographer uh, of Grand Budapest Hotel. What? Uh, yeah, Bill Pope. Oh, Bill, Pope. Bill, Pope. Bill Pope is fantastic. No, it, it's, wait, was it it's fantastic. Oh, God, I am so sorry. I got that mixed up with someone else. 
Uh, it's all good. No, I did no, say Wes Anderson earlier. It's <laughs> made, and it has a few jokes that land, and it's it's well executed for what it is, but it just, it kind of feels bland in a way. And the only the only things that really stand out to me are the getaway sequences, are those music video things and it's like they put i don't know it's almost like those were shot first or something it's like well, those feel like they belong in a different movie almost because the rest of the movie is just kind of by the numbers i i, I don't know yeah. like it's in by the numbers sure but so it's well, well done like it knows yeah, yeah. what it is and it sticks well, to I mean, it and i, I, I don't have a problem with that I, and it's think, kind of self-aware i don't argue. i i think I, I think seeing Nicholas Wending Reffin's drive has like ruined me because yeah, I feel well, like that. I feel like that's, that's the perfected version of this. I and don't. I know think if I that this that. is the perfected version of Drive. So yeah. that's like, ah, it's yeah, like yeah. okay, no, but that's a good point because I think we're leading into a very good like because we're talking about the upper echelon of a certain genre, right? So we're this is no, like no, in sure, retrospect yeah. splitting hairs, but to me it's like it's like what fits you right because the things you're calling bland like i i feel like that's an exact swap of my little uh going on drive that i had because to me this fits like a glove like it is i i throw the word perfect around very rarely but like the reason i saw it over and over again is like the bland things you're talking about are like something done so well that there's no i, I don't even know how to describe it like it's it does kind of have a paint by numbers vibe. It looks almost too perfect that it doesn't have any, you know, like the the grit that would normally come with one of these films. Because I I get what you mean. The actual action sequences have a bit of that grit, but the other stuff is a lot more polished. And it's about it's like artsy. kind of it, in a, a lot of ways, it's kind of a different balance of like what happens with Last Night in Soho, where like instead of the nasty side, this is like the good side. Like they live in these '60s ideals. They dream of this like future of like a car and 60s music and like being with your loved one which you could say is very like americana because remember this is an english direct written and directed by an english dude in his perspective of america so i think that's why you're kind of seeing a very interesting blend of like by the numbers to you may be fresh enough for somebody that's got that little bit of separation from the culture right oh so, no for sure and i i mean and I mean, Drive was actually like written or not written, but it was directed by like a, a Danish, you know, yeah, Nicholas Winding right. Refn is Danish. So, I mean, there is a bit of like culture shock there, I'm sure. But I feel like, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, this is like you were saying, it, it's the upper echelon of a genre. It's a genre that I happen to love. I mean, uh, you know, I, I would argue that that Michael Mann has made a career out of films like this, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, like like Thief and and, uh, you know, there's elements of that in in uh, in Heat where it's like these guys who are walking around these like neon cities and badass cars. And, you know, it's like they live by this almost samurai code. And, and I feel like the film I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's balancing and it's always like on the cusp of greatness. Like that's, that's the thing fair. for me. It's like, I, can work I, that. I feel like the moments that are so great are those action sequences. And then the rest of it is just kind Kinda of there. It just kind of there. It's an okay yeah, that's fair. action See, you know, comedy thriller, but it's not like, it's not life changing, you know what I mean? And, and I feel like there are films that have done this and elevated something like The Driver that have been life changing. And I just wanted more from this. Yeah, that's well, fair. I, Here's I my, the ending you, elevates, you wanted right? your life to change again, and it did. <laughs> no, yeah. I, Here's I, my two cents. I wanted a new about literally the issue. me. Uh, I, yeah. yeah, here's my two cents. Is <laughs> okay. That, the vibe I get with Nicholas Wendon Refn, and don't get me wrong, this approach works for some films more than others, is that he always, the style, I don't like using the P word because Stefan hates it, but I get the feeling he thinks he's making the best film ever made. Like, they kind of have this weird perfectionist yeah. sheen to them almost, and that works for the Neon Demon because it's literally a story about women trying to better themselves and perfect themselves, and it works for Bronson to an extent because it's an idealized version of himself that he's experiencing in prison. But with something like Drive, yeah, it, it doesn't really work. Like it it 
I don't think it knows what it is. I think it thinks it's a lot more clever than what it's going for. That's the vibe I get from the atmosphere in that movie. And Baby Driver, I get more of a, yeah, we've done this before, but we're going to have fun with it. We're going to try a few new tricks, but, you know, we're going to have fun with it. We're going to poke and, fun at it. And I, that's a better vibe for me. I don't know. I, I see, feel more I, comfortable I, with a film that just yeah, knows I, I, what I, it I is. I think Edgar Wright doesn't believe he's making the greatest film in the world. He's yeah. just having fun yes. making something. Exactly. Where Nicholas Winding Refn, I think, is, I, I know he, he was maybe joking about it in that one William Freakin interview, but where we get our uh, William <laughs> Freakin emoji is when Nicholas Winding Refn <laughs> says that like only gods forgives is like the greatest film ever made and the masterpiece because, yeah. because because i made it under budget and william Friedkin's just like who gives a shit william Friedkin is i mean he's hilarious in interviews and i feel like he's got i feel like in that specifically uh Refn was kind of like fucking with him to get a reaction yeah. yeah oh probably but, but i I, I, I think edgar writes a little more on the level either way well, I don't. I don't even. I don't even think that Refn believes. You know, Citizen. Citizen Kane is like just okay, isn't that? Yeah, what he yeah. said? Like he's, <laughs> he's clearly fucking <laughs> with William Friedkin, which is, it's even funnier in context when you think that you know William Friedkin did uh, a, an interview with Fritz Lang, and and he <laughs> was like the kind of cocky young gun at the time, and so it. I, I think there's context, and that was clearly a joke. But I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's kind of like, I mean, it is kind of odd. We're talking about Refn, and we're talking about like Drive and the Neon Demon, and then we're talking about Baby Driver and Last Night at Soho. <laughs> like, they're almost like, you know, they're so similar in a way. And it's actually funny because with, with Refn, I prefer Drive, and with, Edgar Wright, I prefer Soho. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I think this film has its moments. I just wanted a little more. I needed it to go a little further with what it was. I okay. don't think it's a bad right. film. It, like I said, it's very technically well made. It just, I wish it had worked a little better. Well, Okay, well, let's touch on the technical right bit, because I feel like we've been talking a lot about, like, the, the nuance of it. But, like, I just want to say, like, for, like, all of Edgar Wright's films, the reason why this one bubbles to the top for me is because it does knock so many of those things, that like, the, the technical side of it out of the park. I think this is, hands down, the best soundtrack in any of his films. It's, especially because mm. I've noted before, I am, my dad only ever listened to 60s, 50s, bit of 70s when i was growing up so when i hear this i'm just just so i just to give you an insight why it hits me right versus maybe not so much for you guys um i'm now more of a car guy i wasn't so much when i liked this film but this film has actually been a part of the reason i've gotten into driving fast things in my free well like video games and whatnot but like it, it hits all these boxes <laughs> for me and on top yeah. of it it's it's the music video sense and the way that like I, I see those as, as like an, an extra level of perfection where they might seem kind of like you said, it was kind of a shtick almost you're, you're feeling like it was re repeating. Whereas for me, this this reeks of a script that was sitting on a desk for upwards of 10 years. Like there's so few things like I can even see wrong structurally, like the the motivation for everything is there. Um, like down to all the side characters and like their little seedy underworld belly and kind of egging each other on. Like, I feel like every step this film takes is towards the correct end. And I do want to just touch on the end a bit. Like, I think that that, cause I don't, I don't get what you were saying, Ian, about the sacrifice. Cause to me, I saw sacrifices like him turning the car off. Or did you mean like the debate no, of he her openly... driving towards them? No. Because... Yeah. Well that too, but also are the you, fact that he was, about... Well, we're Kevin talking about the Spacey? No. Oh, yeah, Kevin okay. Spacey. No, I'm, I was talking about Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Oh, I was oh, talking okay. about Kevin so, Spacey. No, no, no. Okay, so to me, yeah. I was. that's why I was like, what do you mean? And then you immediately went on to cite why all that's amazing. About oh, no. End. No, so, I meant okay, the Kevin no. Spacey sacrifice. No, no. And, and like, really like you said, maybe he did know something because it's really odd how Kevin Spacey's like, oh, he might have lived. And they just back over his fucking skull to make it clear <laughs> it that was... he is not going to be in <laughs> yeah, the Yeah, I know. And, and <laughs> so the characters just stand there. there and... I, I don't buy that he'd be nice to him at that point in the story. Like, he doesn't yeah, seem yeah. like that kind of character. Uh, and I'll agree with you on the romance, Steven, that, that made me roll my eyes quite a bit. Like, they have a decent chemistry, and the actress I, does a good job. No, nah, they're idealists. Idealist the, 
the the romance was okay. I, I actually thought she was one of the better performances in the whole thing. She does a good I, job. Yeah. No, Look she's she's fantastic. But, uh, there's I a just... lot of the romance I thought was stupid, like the whole like uh Oh, but uh, it's like, oh, you spelled something on the menu wrong. He, he, he is like, come on. Like, that's like the dumbest no, trope mean, in romance. And even... the fact that she knew him for <sighs> three days and was willing to be like, yeah, she I'll go anywhere with, with you. Him from, like, off the bat. Like, she no, yeah. I, see, I, that's I a didn't... 50s kind of romance, though. I, didn't, I know, but ran it's, away. <laughs> that's still stupid. Okay, I didn't even <laughs> mind the romance subplot. I, I thought she was great. I thought some of the writing of that was great. And I liked her performance. I just didn't think that she has great chemistry with him. I, and that's not really that's her fault. That's the part fault, I disagree but, with. <laughs> ah. Yeah, those two I, were I, fucking. I think he like, puts more chemistry in into it yeah, than he does. Those two were fucking with I, your eyes, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah, they were. <laughs> ah, you know. those are I the, don't know, man. Those it, are the eat me eyes. Those are <laughs> yeah, the problems dude. I have with the relationship. <laughs> Anyways, the problem I had was, like... It, it just felt very contrived and very simplistic. I get it's trying to go for those fifty fives, but it, it still just kind of made me roll my eyes. And the fact well, that she see, was willing to go anywhere with him after like barely knowing each other—it's like you had two dates and you're just willing to drive off with him. It, uh, it, there's it's there's really five more time passes, but I feel what you're saying. It's still a very rough yeah, two concept. Dates. <laughs> well, no, and, and here's the thing, too. It's like, if I want to see something like, you know, the kind of neon city, you know, thing, like, I'll watch Drive. I'll watch The Driver. If I want this kind of, like, romance, I mean, Tony Scott's true romance is one of my favorite movies of all time. I love it. It's one of the films that has influenced my own kind of style and writing and projects that I pursue probably more than any other film. So it's like, this is like the watered down version of a bunch of films that I'm very passionate about. And that's why maybe this doesn't work as well. It's like, I've seen all of these elements done better hmm. and, and this kind of feels like taking the most average kind of bland mix of those and and trying to make something out of it but it's got these music video scenes it's got these car chases that are awesome and i want the rest of it to live up to that and that's kind of where yeah. i was at fair enough uh, what about final ratings uh i think i'm <sighs> done with exploring my thoughts uh just mostly <laughs> want to hear steven rant uh final verdicts on baba driver <laughs> I, it's the bye bye driver the 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 bye bye man uh, <laughs> i give this a uh, yeah to kind of go off uh devon's old joke uh i'm gonna give this a 6.9 hey that it makes it better very, it forgiven. is very okay wow I'm i mean 6.9 is still pretty enjoyable for me like that's you know, it's it's not a film that I would highly uh, rate, but it's not one that I would highly critique either. Like, six point nine is still a comfortable rating for me. That said, I would give this like at least a seven point five. Like, it's still quite solid, and I think the music in it is fantastic. Like, your girl was saying the execution of everything. I don't come back to this nearly as often as I do the Cornetto trilogy, because you know can't beat the Simon Pegg and Nick Frost chemistry. Uh, in any of those movies, but it's still it'll get like I still watch this and enjoy it. All right, Daryl, what about you? Uh, I'll this go is last. easily all the best parts of Edgar Wright put together in one Did movie. I disconnect there yeah, a little, a little bit. bit, but it came, but back, came back and sped so up a bit. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I I give this at least a seven point five. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, like I said, this is like the best parts of all of it. I think this is his best shot film. Uh, every single frame, uh, Bill uh, Pope is doing amazing things with negative diffusion, and it kind of keeps this really consistent lighting. He's Some of the great... fucking framing yeah. um, in the middle when like they're on the phone together, like Tad was saying, how like the shots start cutting and they're perfectly like mirroring each other, like leaning against the wall, trapped in the doorway, and like the neons there. Are... Oh yeah, it it really like for me it, it adds all together to the perfect stew like perfect scenery, perfect motivation, one of the best endings to any film I've ever seen. 
where like like you said realistic uh it is a full-on 10 out of 10 for me like, oh best game break film yet. damn wow I'm yeah like i said I've, i have a really personal great. connection to it yeah, yeah so. i agree right on i'm giving this one I, I, I might need yeah. you a little closer i'll give this an eight nice <laughs> i i'm giving it the exact same store score it was a 6.5 but it went up to an eight it's got a few really stupid scenes in it but i don't care it's a wonderful piece about coming to terms with your own actions disguised as a fun pulpy beautifully shot gorgeously composed car chase movie and with some of the best car chase scenes ever like in history like i can't believe Edgar wright did such a great job of car chase scenes despite doing practically barely any <laughs> in any of his own movies like it's insane like how much she him and bill pope and the rest of the crew like they all deserve medals for that alone but it, there was more to the story than i gave it credit for on the first watch and jamie fox i disagree i miss that trope of the love to hate the douchebag kind of character but he's so <laughs> charismatic that you kind of love to hate him we need more characters like that in movies give me more gastons well, I, I i agree with that uh moving on we have the final film we'll be discussing tonight, which is 2021's Last Night in Soho. Uh, this film is about a, an aspiring fashion designer uh, played by Thomason McKenzie, who is mysteriously able to, uh, you know, enter into the past. So she, she starts living at this flat in, in, uh, in Soho, and she's kind of getting her feet off the ground. She's studying fashion. You know, she's trying to enter that world. And every night when she goes to sleep and she dreams, uh, she has these visions of, of a of a young singer, and, and kind of is able to live her life simultaneously in these very uh, bizarre kind of like visions of the past. Uh, that are almost like dreams and and there's a duality there you know kind of like uh, almost like a Mulholland drive or a persona kind of thing uh it, it's uh, okay so uh, tad is now correcting me in the chat that she's <laughs> experiencing the past through a, another person's eyes and so yeah she's not technically interacting with the past but yeah i i mean it's to me, this is what I, I think you guys were describing about Baby Driver, honestly. Like, I feel like this works because it knows what it is. I feel like ah. it's very well shot. It's got these, like, incredible giallo sequences. It, it doesn't, it, it feels like, hey, we're just going to have some fun with this. Um, this was actually one of my top five favorite films of the year last year. We actually briefly touched upon it uh, when we reviewed Eyes Wide Shut and Society and David Cronenberg's Crash, which is thus far our most viewed <laughs> video on our YouTube channel. You should definitely check that us. out. Uh, yeah, if you know, actually, uh, I gave this a rating when we first uh, saw it last year. And I got to say, on a rewatch... I liked it even more. So I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say. I, I would just, before I turn it over to you guys, I did want to say one thing. I thought it was funny how that uh, Tarantino did Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Edgar Wright did Last Night in Soho and then Paul Thomas Anderson did Licorice Pizza. And I'm almost disappointed we didn't do that as a trilogy <laughs> because that's a hell of an idea like that all of these filmmakers are making these like nostalgic memories for, for these moments in time that, uh, that affected them as filmmakers. And I think it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Now, what did you guys think? Well, uh, well, I can pop yeah. in quick because I wasn't on the episode, but it's wild yeah. that you said that about Baby Driver because, hell, we're just polar opposites. I feel <laughs> almost how you said about Baby Driver for this. Wow. I think there's a lot of bland stuff in the middle. I think uh, he, while he may know what kind of film he's trying to make, sadly, that's not an Edgar Wright film. And it really disconnects me from 
the trajectory of the story. On a second watch, I agree. It's I, I found my rating raising. I, I, I don't know, maybe knowing where it was going, I could start getting some of those. Um, there is some good stuff, like we mentioned with Hot Fuzz, where there's some lines in the beginning where I was like, oh, okay, that was something. But uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of nothing in the middle of this movie. And um, I... Yeah, I was so, so excited, and I just really wanted to love it. And you're right, the cinematography is really pretty, but it, I, I, I think I... it might be that there's not someone to, to bounce off. Like, it, usually there's, like, two people, or, like, at least with Baby, he's always bouncing off somebody, whereas I felt like this is her, and we're stuck with her, and she watches things, and it goes slowly. And, like, we're – okay, maybe whereas, like, I said Hot Fuzz was, like, a four-hour-long film condensed, this feels like he actually wrote a 90-minute thing. Like, the it takes its time. It kind of meanders. It references a lot of his own work from the past. Yeah. Like, I, I just I, – I, there, I found a disconnect here. I, I'm still trying to love it. But yeah, opposite I of you. I disagree because here's the thing. I, I almost feel about this like you were talking about Neon Demon where it's like, yeah, it is kind of style over substance and it is kind of goofy and perfectionist. But in this context, it works. Uh, and I think that there's an element of this. I don't know if that's this. exactly what it's going for. Yeah, no, it is. It, it I mean, it's... It's almost like, you know, there's elements of Midnight in Paris in this. There's uh, yeah, elements of sure. Nightmare on Elm Street. And I mean, yep. I think it's brilliant. You know, Mark Kermode, when he reviewed this film, he actually said that he was surprised that people thought it was the least Edgar Wright film that he had ever directed because he thought it was the most Edgar Wright film he yeah. had ever directed. This it's sort always, of yeah. nostalgia yeah. for 60s England and the swinging music and the style. I mean, to me, this has Edgar Wright written all over it, which is, I mean, just the opposite of what I thought of, like, Baby Driver. So, I, I love this film. I watched this film a second time, and I was really excited to give it another chance. I watched it in 4K, and man, does did the 4K transfer look gorgeous. I was hoping I liked it better. I might like it even worse. Like, I actually kind of hate this movie. And the biggest wow. thing is, I, I don't think it knows what it is. It tries to do yeah. so many genre trappings, but unlike the Cornetto trilogy, and unlike arguably Baby Driver, at least in my opinion... I don't think it succeeds at anything it's going for. Like, it's it's not funny enough to be a comedy. It's definitely not scary enough to be a horror movie. Every jump scare was like a comedy beat. I couldn't stop laughing <laughs> every time, like, Doctor Who showed up on screen screen and yelled something in British. Like, it, it, the characters aren't compelling or complex enough for it to be a good drama. And it's way laughably unsubtle <laughs> to be, like, so the unsubtle. satire piece that's trying to be, like... You know how you've said, like, Baby Driver is a beta version of The Driver, and you're probably right to a certain extent. This feels like the beta version of Black Swan. <laughs> I constantly thought, like, wow, Black Swan tackled these themes so much better. Did not, I did tackled... not care for Black Swan. The thing about Black Swan is I feel like I feel like Black Swan is the inferior version of Mulholland Drive. And so I this is wow. this is like to me. Well, this then maybe is it's what... the beta version of Mulholland Drive, then. <laughs> no, I I mean yeah, I mean I yes, have... it's inferior to Mulholland Drive, but I, I I feel like this is what I wanted Black Swan to be. I think that it's fun. I think it's goofy. I think it I knows think... what it is. I don't. Think it's it just you know, it, it's like this giallo slasher. I mean, I kind of love the idea that they're playing with of like. He's Harvey Weinstein, but he's like a Freddy Krueger kind of guy. And you've got these, you know, maskless zombies. I mean, I, I think it works. And I think men, all of this. And all men are terrible people. Also, your honor. No, I don't I bring, think that I bring the court no, case. I that. Okay, there's some <laughs> nutty I, I, stuff. Wait a minute, in wait a minute, wait a minute. Right. I have heard that criticism leveled at this film. And I disagree. The cop. How? 
who's trying to save her is a good guy. She but he acts it like a rapist the... in every okay. other scene. That bothered He's the crap out of me. He He's acts a... like it, though. That bothered the crap out of me because... Well, it's a bait and switch. He... He's just a friendly old man. So but it's so obvious. Led to believe it's that so the mystery... obvious, though. It's so predictable, like, what they're doing. I the first don't... time I yeah. watch it, I'm like, well, this is just a red herring. Okay, but it's using those genre trappings... To, to tell this kind of goofy story. But that's story. been done works, so many times before. Like, no. it's that was like straight out of uh, uh, what's the movie with uh, the 70s horror movie when they're in Italy and the guy's daughter passed away. I'm sorry, what is the Don't Look Now? I think it's what it's called. Oh, like, that God. was just straight I up mean, Don't Look on. Now. No, don't, it don't, okay, well, up, don't look now. Come on, that whole okay. twist with the the little people. We're we're not gonna get. Well, into that. regardless of these other movies, I think what <laughs> really was a pat like what really is clear for the influence of this, and where I'll kind of disagree with you, where it's positive is. Uh, it's it's Polanski more than anything. I feel like Rosemary's Baby's vibes. I feel Repulsion vibes with all the hands coming out of the walls, and like he gives it a reason. That's... But there's here. Okay, here's my biggest issue. I think this was two drafts away from being baby driver perfect. There's a couple aspects of the film that make the entire thing fall to crumbles. And it's part of Tad's point why he specified. But for me, I don't think that this whole viewing it through her eyes perspective thing, I think that's kind of bullshit. Many times in the behind the scenes, Edgar Wright specifically says it's a time travel thing. She's time traveling. If that's the case, why the hell are we seeing Sandy get killed? She sees, she says multiple times, this, this, and that he gives it away or like he plays us by doing a close up of the, like the blade going downwards as we can clearly see is going down towards sandy getting more and more bloody which doesn't actually happen in real life and maybe she sees herself as a victim but we shouldn't see that if that scene was cut maybe five minutes earlier i think the flow of the movie would feel a bit better it feels cheap it feels like he's trying to lean into these twists whereas he never had to do that before with hot fuzz well he's laying think... blocks that actually uh, fall into place and like I, I feel you but then look at the ending so the repulsion thing like specifically with the references you're saying the hands coming out of the floor holding her to the ground doesn't make fuck all sense when she gets on the bed like they tear her away from the phone to have a guy pick up the phone and hand it to her and say help if you wanted her to help that but should have been clear cool. from the beginning like I, I don't get why we're playing these zombie things as like a negative if they want help it doesn't make fuck all sense and there's too many things that play into this like oh it's a 70s kind of like you're saying galeo kind of thing like i think that edgar wright is better than this screenplay and you know yeah, we've heard the story I it's know. you know edgar wright and quentin tarantino are chilling and it started like i think he really wanted to make baby driver 2 first that obviously couldn't happen for reasons we named earlier and then oh yeah there's this movie named last night in soho i'm gonna write a script i think you know pandemic and everything. like it was else. getting it out yeah sure but it's just one of those things where i no, feel like I mean, this I... was too soon rushed to screen and while there's amazing texas switches amazing beautiful color cinematography i think the core story is where this falls apart versus some no other and i movies. think i think it knows what it is i think it is kind of goofy i think it is is kind of derivative but i think it accepts that it's it's yeah Does it's it playing though? with Polanski. Like it's trying to no, have no, like no, this no, huge no, statement no, about let him finish, finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> let him finish it's playing with polanski it's playing with dario argenti uh, argento <laughs> it's got these like sleazy you know like 1970s vibes and i just fine. Yeah, no, it's vibes, but it's like I'm looking at it and it's like it knows what it is. It's fun. I had a blast watching this. When I watched it, I was picking up on things that I didn't even get the first time. And like, I just, I think this movie was fun. I think it's a lot better than you guys are giving it credit for. I think it knows what it is more than you guys are giving it credit for. I feel so, like this what is you, what. What do you think? Yeah, yeah I'm so done. sorry. So, so this is my first time ever watching this, and I had, you know, <laughs> put off seeing it. I, um, you know, when every time a movie gets, like, super hyped and people have different opinions about it, I maybe have a hard time kind of shaking all those off before I go into a film. So I wanted to wait for the hype to die down, and by the time that we got to watch this, like, okay, I'm going to go in. It's a new Edgar Wright movie. I'm excited to see it. And I watched it, and I enjoyed it. And there was a lot of, like, cool elements in it, but nothing i don't know it didn't resonate as much with me as the other films instantaneously i do want to go see it again just to 
see if I pick up on any other things. But I felt like, I don't know, there, there's a lot of great stuff in here, but I feel like they could have fleshed it out just a little bit more because some things don't quite make sense. I do like the vision of having all these, you know, the, the guys seem kind of, kind of like ghouls, which would make sense from her perspective. Um, there is some cool nightmare imagery in here, and I like that when she, you know, dreams, she has these visions of this other kind of life. And I do feel like that is something that people get, uh, you know, wrapped up into when they look at films about the past and they're nostalgic for this time period they were never part in. They start to ruminate and they start to, it starts to influence their life. Like I feel like that that's a very real thing that I relate to in a sense, where you start to have these ideals about a past time that weren't exactly real. The fact that this person that she has visions about was an actual real person i don't know if that actually works for me like yeah. how did she get those psychic kind of imaginings the from room, that I I well guess. she like, is the portrayed. bodies in the room yeah like, well she is portrayed as a psychic early on in the film because she has visions of her mother or she's schizophrenic we don't know or, or she yeah. you know and, and, and I, I was waiting for i was waiting for the rug to get pulled out from under me where I was kind of expecting it maybe to go in a Shutter Island type of territory. Yeah. yeah. Where, no, you know I what mean, I mean? An I, I, I felt like there was another layer there that could have been added that could have – and there, there no, could have been no, another – I'm I, telling you, I, two yeah, drafts there's away. There's a and level I, that, of, of magical realism that is established very early on, and I think it's believable that for her to be as young as she is and kind of like fish out of water, maybe her visions aren't – like perfect yet i mean i i think that you know talking about like uh well we don't know that like it's kind of cheap for him to like uh, uh, lead you the wrong way with the death of sandy i mean i don't i think that's kind of nitpicking when you're talking about like she's it's kind of important man no it's I, not, I, it's I, not I, feel, I feel that's, that's so years old. he's not portrayed as this like grand fortune teller or like medium that would be goofy but it's like she's experiencing these things she's got a window to the past i mean it's almost like you had, like if you had no context uh, of watching a movie and it's like you know uh, like kevin spacey i mean like you look into the past and you're like wow this guy's great yeah and but hear me out why out. does it lie i get what you're saying in terms of like that's the way we're viewing it but th there's no reason if it, you either have to establish that yes she's directly tapping into the old woman and her perception because then i might believe some of this fuckery but if she's just a plain old medium why is a specific detail that misleads the audience the one thing that's we're being lied about like because i get what you're saying you could have leeway I mean, that's, that's, that's just my it. issue. You need oh, two no. more drafts I, I to figure it out. I don't think out. that's a like... good enough reason. <laughs> I, I agree. I think one or two more drafts would have really fleshed out certain details and really made, like, a last act kind of reveal connect all the dots so perfectly. There's still a lot of, like, yeah. unanswered questions, and not in, like, a provocative way like David Lynch. And, like, there, there's, there's some stuff that you set up here that I don't know if you quite paid off. Where if they did it in a well, David Lynch way, where no, it was more I mean, of a vague allusion to this kind of thing. It. I, I think exactly. I think it would, uh, it would lean into that. It would have been so much better. Just lean yeah. into the dream yeah. moments more. I, I, but I feel like this is so close to perfect. And There's Ted lots of great is... stuff in here that I appreciate, but I feel like they, hmm, it, it's almost but not quite there for me. I will have to watch it again to see really how I feel about it. Um, and I and and I am interested enough in it to want to want to watch it again. But yeah. I do feel like there well, is just and... some things that didn't quite connect that they could have, if they just push a little further, or if they put in more of a lynching territory i think would have really made it work for me okay well, i've got a point that might sum up a lot of what we've been and sorry steve i'll let you go after this but no no I, no no i, I was I've just got gonna a... say Tad is bringing up in the chat that her mm -hmm. uh grandmother makes a comment that that her mom had this gift and it drew drove her mad and it mm -hmm. led her to commit suicide and i think that yeah i mean there's like you know, th there's that element of misdirection. And for me, I mean, it was believable. It worked. If we're going to believe that, you know, she's having these visions in the first place, like you're going in accepting this level of like Dario Argento kind of like magical realism, almost like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street. I, I didn't feel taken out of it by the fact that maybe she saw something the wrong way. But I mean, clear that... rules are set in those things you're talking about, right? Like Nightmare on Elm, we master the rules of, like, the two realms. And, like, mm -hmm. I, 
I don't know that where you go full Lynch and there's no rules, right? Like, I just feel like this plays in a gray area where it's only beneficial for, like you're saying, the flow of the film that these things all fall into place. Well, but this film is not trying to be more than an elevated kind of, you know, fashion story. And that's kind of what I love about it. I think that it could have been, though. Well, I think it's a geology. But I I don't think it leads into the goofiness enough. And when it does, it's just not funny. Like, there's so many parts where I was just thinking, that's not funny. Like, you're you're better than that, Edgar. Like, that gay could have been so much better. If if you're going to shoebotch it into, oh, it's just a Diablo or it's just this, why couldn't it be more than that? Why can't it... Pay homage to these like things. Like Hot Fuzz is more than being the buddy cop movie. Yeah, I, 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 you know, like no, I don't yeah. think that it. Well, I don't think that it has to be transformative. It I don't doesn't think have to every, be. But with my expectations, well, no, 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 right no, no, at this point, bingo. That that's my bigger point. Movie has to subvert and reinvent the genre. This is like to me. This is like. I mean, it's kind of like Drive in the sense. It's like you've got this kind of B movie plot. And you're elevating it through the but direction. It doesn't through do the same I've got, it doesn't I've got two it. notes, man. So A, on the Galileo thing, if you're going to use that re- excuse, then y'all got to listen to me about fucking Knock Knock because you fought so hard when I tried to play this for Knock Knock and said, no, no, it doesn't work. But no, like I, I get what you're saying because I, I've felt that way before. But B, my bigger point that I've been trying to get out, I think there's something bigger going on with Edgar Wright that has kind of spurred everything we've talked about tonight that we need to acknowledge. He is operating at such a high level of quality and content that we have gotten a Cornetto trilogy. Fantastic. One of the best like uh, manga, whatever you want to call it, adaptations with Scott Pilgrim. Then, like I said, Baby Driver is fucking way up there for me. And like he's got this track record that has built to a point where we all are gravitating to certain films based on really niche things so i don't need think it needs to necessarily sure. divide us i think we can acknowledge that like we're dealing with someone here who's so talented that like this is slipping like it's like a glove onto steven's hand whereas for us it's not quite right for me baby driver's perfect and for you guys you know there's little things that are off that's perfectly fine because this guy has made some of the greatest things that have come out in this past like few decade decade and a half however long he's been working oh so 100 like, well, yeah, whatever you we're I have hair. about this film i still love this guy as a filmmaker and yeah. any time that he announces something he's doing i'm there for it it doesn't matter like he I've, I've earned enough respect even if soho didn't quite work me on a first watch i'm still interested enough to take it another look at it um and it's just that i have built such a high expectation for his films at this point and this is also what i was trying to get away from not wanting to watch it right away once it when when it first came out is because i didn't want to go in with heightened expectations based on what people had said or any negative expectations either i wanted to come in completely neutral and be in that zone where i can be blown away by it yeah and i almost was but it wasn't quite and I just well, want to say that because we're not trying to, to shit say, on you, Steve, right? Like, no, we're saying, no, no, like, it, we do, do like the movie. Bring but... up, I do want to bring up one thing because, kind of touching off what you were saying, Daryl, it's not just passion and craftsmanship, it's like level of cinematic knowledge. It's like the things that he's pulling from. It's like, yeah, Shaun of the Dead is, you know, this zombie movie and he's drawing from that. And, you know, you look at like Hot Fuzz and it's an 80s cop action movie thing. And this to me is like his, you know, Polanski, Argento, uh, uh, you know, whatever. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he's a genre filmmaker. And so if his version of like, you know, this film doesn't work, but his version of like, you know the michael mann kind of like walter hill driver thing works i mean i do think we're kind of splitting hairs with that you know yeah yeah. that's personal preference i guess but i one thing i wanted to bring up is in the last review i mentioned that uh, (laughs) this movie made me appreciate baby driver more and one reason for that is as much as i don't like the relationship in baby driver the relationship with John in this movie is ten times worse. Like, what a fucking piece of wallpaper. Like, I don't even know what they like about each other. Is it just because he's such a nice guy? He's just, there's nothing wrong with him. It's the problem I have with the bridge of, you know, bridge to Terabithia, where the one girl dies, and it's supposed to be really sad, but 
I felt nothing for that character because they were just perfect. They were really nice. They were really pretty. They're just a perfect, bland character. And I feel the same for this. Like, there's a scene where John is in danger, and I'm just the whole time thinking, why should I care about this guy? This guy's not a character. <laughs> He's I mean, just you a don't really nice want guy. him to die on principle. I mean, yeah. But, you know, yeah, I mean... I, but I feel nothing for this character. I don't know why I should care that he's well... even in danger right now. And also, like, I don't even know... At least a baby driver, I knew what they liked about each other. It's like, okay, they both yeah. like music. He sees his mother and her a little bit. And, you know, they both kind of miserable in the places they've ended up in life. Great. I know what they like about each other. What does she like about John? Is it because he's pretty? Is it the sex? Like, yeah, what is and it? it I don't know why you have a of like, what, you get a relationship because you don't let up and you won't leave her alone all these times when she's running away from you and you're like, yeah. I'm here for you. Like, that's kind of a fine line to walk if you're saying that that's actually building, like, a good relationship. Because I'm seeing that. I was waiting for it to twist, right? Like, he keeps, like, he follows her outside after the club. They're in yeah. the rain. They're in the fucking library and he's chasing her around. Like, you know what they should have done? felt, like, creepy like he, almost. He like, should have been, like, a creep by the end of it and the cop was going to stop him. That's what I think should have happened. That would have oh, been like an interesting of twist. The cop? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. would have been an interesting twist. It's like the cop was like, okay, I've been following this guy around. I didn't want to say anything because they won't put you in danger. That would be like interesting take on it. And also it's like, of course, the one non-white character is going to be like a total sweetheart. Like the movie's just so manipulative and cheap. Like there's so many moments that just felt cheap and not earned in any way, shape, ah, or form. I mean, this is like, kind around of every like corner, what you guys... This it's what you said like about what... The Witch, where it's like, it's incredibly unsubtle messaging. Like, th that's how I felt about this movie, but it's even more egregious because it comes well, from a director I genuinely love. Well, well I'll give Steve the... credit. Like, the thing he's talking about, about it being a Galileo film, whatnot, it's like, that kind of works because those films aren't perfect, and they'd be rushed, and they'd be trying to put out a horror movie with, like, aesthetic in mind, and, like, we'll figure yeah, out the script on the I day. Mean... So in that aspect, like, so maybe there's a little purpose. bit of leeway, but this is Edgar Wright. Like, you could say the same thing about action movies, and he didn't do that with Hot Fuzz. He made a, a yeah. fucking airtight script with Hot Fuzz, so we know well, he, he can do it. That's the... Sorry. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. I mean, this to me is kind of like what I wanted Neon Demon to be, because, you know, you guys were were talking about that film earlier. And, and the thing about Neon Demon is like, I, I know this is kind of like vaguely related, but it's like with Only God Forgives, Refn made something that was so like. It was so like uh, uh, vague and like almost Lynchian, and it was really leaning into this kind of odd symbolism. And and then with Neon Demon, I felt like it was a step backwards because it was so blunt and it was so like kind of on the nose. I, and I feel like I, it had I more mean, fun like, with that though. This film just I parts of it feel that way, agree. but other parts of it I feel, feel like, like it's taking itself well, seriously. I I kind of disagree. I feel like like you know the thing about neon demon was like it just i had seen so much better from nicholas wending refn by that point and with this like i mean baby driver was kind of a disappointment and i really gravitated to this one i think that yeah i mean i i, I don't necessarily even agree that this is like a men bad kind of movie there I, are characters... 100 percent is a men bad movie literally the no, first cab not. driver it's... she goes with is just a rapist <laughs> it's just and a people no, deserve the, the to die because they get sex workers like, exactly I, 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 it, it makes Pop sense from her perspective her i don't think the really fully you know I, I think it's just showing it from her perspective. I don't know if it fully, you know, has that thing. I mean, maybe, but I didn't. I didn't get that angle from it necessarily. I don't know. But it does show how you know, well, when someone's creepy, she'll kind of see him in that sense, and and that that's kind of just. Well, her... I mean, in a way, she's kind of this like unreliable kind of narrator. She's oh, young, come like on. It, you know. Yeah. Oh, come on, no, seriously. I mean, we're we're seeing things through her perspective. It could be. That yeah, she's having you know visions that don't match up exactly the way that they're supposed to be. I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying. It's like if we're gonna believe that this character is having visions anyway, like why is it so much like but, so hard to believe that this power that was passed down to her 
from you know her her mom is like not working perfectly i mean i i feel like that's kind of nitpicky I don't, and i feel like well, it it under there, there, there is one thing there, there is, is one thing i would like it to have uh, explored more where so so she was quite wrong about the one character who at first seemed creepy and she was accusing of being the bad guy but it turns out he was a cop and it turned out that she was wrong about her judgment of him i felt like it could have kept going with that route a little bit like what else has she been assuming incorrectly that is just her kind of paranoid perspective and i'm not saying that you know women that accuse men of being whatever should all be disbelieved it's just that sometimes if you're put into this kind of position and you're reading everything in this paranoid way this 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 can happen to anybody and that's where I was thinking it could go more in that Shutter Island territory where everything that you've assumed to be uh, one way going in turns out to not be quite that way Well, when you find out later on. And I feel like it could have taken a little more in that route. And that was just like the start of that. And um, I don't know. I feel like it could have gone a little more in that route where she was making these assumptions based off of uh, these visions that she's having. And it's just her kind of adjusting to the city and um, – being fearful of things and how that's kind of altering her perspective. And I feel like it could have taken a little more of that psychological route where it took more of the metaphysical, um, supernatural route a little more so. Just lean into it, but it doesn't lean into anything. It feels like it's too scared to go in any direction. And when it does go that. in any direction, it just I didn't don't work know for me. But... Well, it does lean, though, and that's the thing I, I dislike is, like, once we finally get, like, this co like confrontation between her and these creatures, like, they're holding her down and they're trying to get her to help. It feels muddy, like. I don't know. It's kind of a mess. Like it feel like you said, it just feels rushed. It feels like it needed another draft or two. And I I would agree with the unreliable narrator if they leaned into it more. But as it stands, it's just you just did the dumb writing trope where we're gonna make a character look super guilty and act out of character just so the audience thinks, Wow, that must be the bad guy. But that's been done so many times before. You did it in Hot Fuzz, and you did it better in Hot Fuzz. You've done it better in your own movies. I don't know. I couldn't get this film. It's very pretty. Anya Taylor-Joy is great in it. But she's really the only performance I liked. Everybody else, for me, was like either way too over the top, or Thomas and McKenzie was... I love her in other movies. I love her in Jojo Rabbit. I love her in Leaf No Trace. <laughs> I thought she was awful. I thought she was awful in this movie. And I can't I really... I think she was... You, you, you know what it was? Like, there was this exercise I had in drama class in high school where they said, all right, you got to – we're going to give you these emotions, and you got to act out these emotions in a quick, like, improvised play. And we'd all do, like, these really exaggerated motions to show, like, how scared we were or how angry we were. That's what her performance felt like in this movie. Nothing she did felt convincing in any way, which is not how I want wow. her character to be. I disagree. I thought she was just as I, good, if not Apparently the only one that Taylor feels Joy. that way, so that's fair. Uh, well, I mean, Tad feels that way, but he's not on right now. He's in the chat listening. Uh, let's give our final ratings. Yes, uh, it I'm is gonna, I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just jump right out there. This is what I wanted Baby Driver to be. It works for me personally. Uh, I, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. All right, I wanted about this you? to be nice. as cool. good I'm as gonna Baby give Driver. give it a 6.9. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You did it. Yeah, I wanted uh, And this, this is only from one watch. It could go up or down for me uh, on a second. There's still a lot in it that I really appreciate. It just didn't quite hit home for me like some of the other films, but I still really appreciated it. So, you know, um, it's not my favorite Edgar Wright film uh, by any means, but I still respect him a lot as a filmmaker, and I am excited for whatever he uh, makes next. Anything he's involved in will be interesting. So for now, this is a 6.9. That's not to say Last Night in Soho was so-so, but I couldn't resist the pun. <laughs> Daryl? <laughs> Boo this man. Uh, I, I really, uh, I wanted this to be baby driver, man. I saw the commercials and like, it had the sixties vibes. It had the one shot at the beginning. Like, I feel like it had the building blocks. Like I said, there's it like half built the tower and then put like a bunch of fucking plastic on top and said, Oh, we're done. Like, I feel really, guys. we were so fucking <laughs> close, but I will up it because you guys have upped it all night. 
Uh, I was going to go 7-5, but honestly, on a rewatch, there is a lot of good little nods in the beginning I didn't catch the first time. And while there are a couple really crucial things for me that fall apart, I think the rest of the movie still deserves its credit to get the, the 8 out of 10. A hey. 4 out of 10. I, It's very pretty. Uh, Anya Taylor Joy's great. She does her own singing too, which I thought was a really cool Easter egg. Town, town. Oh yeah. And oh. but I really couldn't get this movie. I thought the story was awful. I thought the pacing was really bad. I thought a lot of the CGI looked bad. Like I thought some of the CGI looked worse than the CGI blood and hot fuzz. And it's just such wow. a mess. I, I felt unfinished. I, 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 I do have one nitpick. There's there's one I shot hate, kind in of this painted. that. There, there, there's one shot in this that I think would have looked excellent on the storyboard, and he thought, like, yeah, this is a great shot on, on paper where you see the reflection of her eyes as she's getting stabbed. That's and it's a awesome. really cool shot, it's a great shot, but the way it's composited it looks so fake to me. I'm yep. sorry, but... Literally, the composite on that just looks so half-baked to me. Um, yep. <laughs> but it, it is a cool composition, I'll give it that. But that was the most CG-looking blood I'd seen in a while. Yeah. Yeah. It, I wish then I it, looks great it is meant, to be, honor, it is meant right? to be like a cartoony giallo type of frame. So right. I do and give it that's to why, there. No, but that's why that worked for me in Last Night in Soho, but didn't work in Hot Fuzz. Like the the artificiality is built in in this. You right, know, I don't remember giallo uh, using CGI. I don't know. Compared yeah. to most eighties <laughs> action films, I think it was quite polished. Come. And, yeah, yeah. towards its genre right. i will say though one little quick note before the end because you just reminded me saying the singing the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me in any theater for a trailer oh, was yeah. when the first time i ever saw this in theaters i forget what the fuck we were watching but we're all sitting down and the way the first trailer began was her doing the really creepy like the beginning to downtown where it's like oh, you can always go but it didn't say downtown in that very first like the very first stanza of it and like seven different people from varying points of the art audience all went downtown and oh, it was the creepiest fucking thing I've, I, my body got chills and i felt like scared <laughs> as fuck yeah. i was like was that planned was That's i a plant like with the no it was just you I, know uh, everyone thought the same <laughs> I, I i do have to say that that initial trailer absolutely gives you chills and it was oh. and it was very good it did it, it, it give me hyped for it but for some reason i just couldn't make it out to the theater when it was coming out and then people were coming up saying oh it's pretty good but it's not as great as other stuff and i didn't want to go in with that kind of predication in mind i wanted to go in still you know with like neutral expectations but still like you're right i know it's going to be a good time so i i held off on watching it for a little while but i'm glad i finally did yeah. um and i do want to go see it again just to see how i really feel yeah. about it I'm i just wish it left a little more of an impression on a first viewing uh, something I For wanted me. to bring up real quick too about this movie is, did you guys think there was some pretty blatant product placement <laughs> in this movie? Because I couldn't help but notice that in a second watch. There's a scene in Dude, particular. Oh, which one? Where Thomas Holy shit, is, Oh, the no, the Coca-Cola. Oh, one, the Coke. But yeah, also, yeah. like, there's she's wearing Beats headphones in the train, and there's a side shot oh, where she's on the yeah. side. I swear on my fucking life, she moves. So the B on the Beats headphones goes in focus. Bro, I swear funny, on my fucking life. Funniest thing. So in like, my next on. film, the very beginning of the movie, we have someone wearing the same pair of headphones, but we had to put black tape. Well, sorry, it was the black version. Yeah. But the same exact make of everything. And we had to tape over it. And when we were just watching, I forget if it was Tad or Jamar, I had a comment of like, imagine the day when we don't have to tape over our logos and we can put them right in focus, right on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? One Hate product placement, baby. Yep. Oh, every, no, but Coors, there, that's what knows got me. Beats headphones. You know, you know, I, I think I'd respect it more if they were cost headphones. Those are at least actually like vintage. And, yeah, yeah, so true. I never know? thought of it that way. Why wouldn't she be wearing vintage sixties? You can. They're still three point five mil, right? So fuck it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess Bluetooth nowadays that does suck. <laughs> um anyways yeah the coors that's what got me like fucking the main beer that we see in this film is a fucking denver based beer like wouldn't it be heineken wouldn't it be i guess cronenberg gets a lot no no it's coors it's coors for the good guys the bad guys drink other beer oh there you go they pulled an amazing spider-man you're gonna tell me they drink piss water in england no no 
Yeah, fucking I mean, queer I will stuff. Say why, why would it be anything other than Guinness? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. They, 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 they even had a, an advertisement saying, oh, goodness, my Guinness in, in the background, which is an exact poster I remember seeing in a bar recently. Uh, one of those vintage Guinness posters. So I they, will they say uh, Corona is probably offering good money to not be associated <laughs> with uh, <laughs> the Fast anyway. and the Furious is getting a lot of money for this. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. <laughs> this oh, yeah. was a fucking amazing episode. Thank you, Tad, great. for listening in, and thank you, Stephen and Daryl, for joining in as awesome guests for the discussion. As always. Devin. Thank you, thank you. I believe it's your episode oh. next, on Thursday. Yes. We will try yes. we have our an best episode to run next it on week. Thursday. Yeah, it was, you know, well, we're, we, you know, we're, we have to run it on Thursday, and, yep. and, and that's because uh, the two guests that we have invited have graciously moved their schedules around to make sure that their Thursday was free. So it's going to be happening on a Thursday no matter what. If so, anyone um, else fails, I can fill in because I love those films. Just saying. Okay. Because if so you need that, Next week... Well, I appreciate it. And actually, it's funny that you gave some uh, unintentional or maybe intentional foreshadowing. You mentioned School of Rock because next week we are talking about music education, uh, which is an episode that I'm very passionate about. Uh, you know, I, what, what, one of the few subjects that I ever excelled in in school was music because it's something that I've been – I've had a, I have a lifelong passion for. So I want to look at these films that reflect on that. These are films that I got into – growing up in high school and whatnot and i have very different opinions or very uh, uh i guess varied opinions on them uh based on my real life experience but we are talking uh we have two guests coming on next week one is a friend of mine named costa chatsis who is also a music uh instructor who i am currently taking drum lessons from and uh, he's going to be on talking about uh his experiences as a music educator and just a touring uh, musician in various projects. And then a friend of his, um, whose name escapes me at the moment, but he will introduce himself, uh, is a friend of his who went to Berkeley School and uh, went to like one of the most prestigious music ed school schools in all of America and uh, now teaches guitar independently. Uh, so we're going to be talking with them all about uh, these films. The films we're looking at next week are Mr. Holland's Opus, which I have uh, fond memories watching in school. Mr. Um, Hall of Sopus? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Holland's Opus. Then School of Rock, as we mentioned, which is, you know, one of the movies that I loved as a, t as a teenager. And then Whiplash. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which, 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 which will be very interesting to talk about and reflect on, because I remember really liking it when it first came out and well, well, we'll see what I think about that next week. But I'm super excited, super pumped for it. Can't wait to talk about them. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Until next time. Stay tuned for Conan. Yeah. Oh my god, this is the third <laughs> week in a row! You screw up every time! <laughs> are we, we going to do a take two on I, that I, one? No, I take messed that, I I messed that up. I messed that up. Is it Thursday yet? Uh, okay. And then I say, is it Conan? Steven, no, too I may have up. messed take that two. up on purpose. Take two. I may have done and that on purpose this time. Three, two. Is it first day yet? <laughs> Devin just left. Oh, no. All right. Bye, everybody. See ya.